Thinking. This is the title of a course that psychology professor, Wu Qianlan, regularly teaches at Yale University. The event is so popular that it now fills the largest lecture halls at the elite university. On shows in a realistic and understandable way what makes good thinking and how it leads to better decisions. It sheds light on the mistakes in thinking we all make all the time and how we can overcome them so that we can make better individual decisions and together form an open and solidary society. The good news for you, you don't have to study at Yale to take advantage of Ahn's simple but compelling tips. Her book, Think Clearly, summarizes the main points. And we have prepared them for you in this video. Easier thought than done, the fluency effect. Do you know that? You see a video tutorial on YouTube, for example, for a cooking recipe or a household repair and think, it actually looks really easy. I think I can do that too. But then you set about implementing it and fail miserably. Wu Qianan also regularly gives her students this experience. In her course, she repeatedly shows them a dance sequence of a few seconds, followed by detailed instructions. Then the students can volunteer to dance the short choreography. If you can do that, you even get a prize. There are always enough volunteers. But no matter how confidently they approach the task, nobody gets the dance right. The problem that arises here is based on the so-called fluency effect. Fluency translates to lightness or fluency, and roughly speaking, it describes how well our brains can grasp new information. And most of the time we understand quite quickly how processes work theoretically, even if we only observe them. That makes a lot of sense, in and, of itself, and forms a central part of the metacognition, that is, our knowledge of what we know. It helps us assess situations and plan our next steps. But as far as our self-assessment is concerned, we cannot blindly rely on these processes. Because the fluency effect quickly leads to a kind of arrogance, we believe we can do things because we understand them theoretically. However, we often underestimate how difficult it is to put them into practice. Or to put it another way, we think we have fluency just by looking at it. Luckily, there are easy ways to override the fluency effect. One is to practice putting it into practice. This is useful for a lecture or for movement sequences, for example, a short dance choreography. But some things cannot be studied. This is where it helps to plan ahead. Imagine you are planning to build a loft bed for the children's room. Then first make yourself aware that your brain tends to be arrogant. Therefore, it is likely that you underestimate the effort. So outsmart your upstairs. Just plan for an extra buffer, whether that means more time, more money, or more effort. As a rule of thumb, you should revise your original estimate up by about 50%. You think you'll have the loft bed ready in two days? Then plan three days in advance. We often only see what we want to see, the confirmation bias. Let's do a little experiment. A sequence of three numbers follows, which follows a certain rule. Your task now is to recognize this rule and name your own series of numbers that also follow this rule. Clear so far? Let's go. The first three numbers are 2, 4, and 6. What rule connects them and what are your three numbers? This little attempt goes back to an experiment that the thought psychologist Peter Wason conducted in 1960. When Ann asks her students this task, she often gets the sequence 4, 6 and 8 as an answer. And this sequence actually follows the rule. But what is this? If you now answer, even numbers that increase in increments of 2, you're making the same mistake as many of the psychology students at Yale. Because that's not the rule. As soon as students hear this, they start making wilder and more desperate assumptions. Until they realize that the rule is much simpler. It simply states that the following number is greater than its predecessor. The sequence can therefore rise at will. The two-step hypothesis is unnecessarily complicated. The experiment illustrates the phenomenon of confirmation error. We tend to filter our perception for information that confirms our expectation. This narrows our thinking and blocks our view of solutions that tend to be better or simpler. So how do you bypass the confirmation error? For example, by not seeing your assumptions directly as truths, but as hypotheses. For each hypothesis, formulate a counter-hypothesis and then try to confirm both. This way you can make sure you don't get caught on the obvious solution. Because we prefer stories to numbers, the danger of example. Imagine you signed your child up for two sports, ice skating and soccer. 
But even after three years, you don't see any progress here or there. Your child is still wobbly stumbling across the ice. And in football, it actively runs away from the ball instead of challenging it. What do you conclude from this? You're probably thinking, my kid just doesn't like sports. At least that's how it felt for Wook Young on. But then her son discovered cross-country running in high school. He became an aspiring runner and even a team captain. How was that possible? Apparently it wasn't that he didn't like sports. He was simply not interested in the two sports his mother had chosen for him. It was then that On realized her own short-sightedness, she had made her wrong assumption based on just two examples, when there are hundreds of sports in the world. And instead of collecting more evidence, she had stuck to the narrative that her son was unsportsmanlike. This brings us to the next misconception, we humans prefer stories to numbers. Numerous studies show that we respond more to narratives than to statistics. This is also reflected in the first major campaign for the prevention of lung cancer, which the US health authority carried out in 2012. In it, ex-smokers told how much their lives had improved since quitting tobacco. Shortly thereafter, 12% more people nationwide tried to give up smoking. Such anecdotally charged campaigns are always more effective than abstract cancer statistics or warning stickers. But it becomes difficult when the numbers consistently speak a different language than the stories because then we have to overcome our weakness for narratives in order to make rational and prudent decisions. But that works. Here's how. Start getting used to bigger data. One reason we're skeptical of numbers is that we've only recently started using them to understand the world. Probability theory, for example, has only existed since the late 16th century. In addition, we rarely come into contact with scientific statistics in everyday life. Handling such data can be learned, but it is often difficult to transfer it to everyday life. But sometimes it's easier than we think. The best example of this is, that law of large numbers. The more data you consider, the better your decision will be. Think of Wook Young An's wrong conclusion. It was based on only two empirical experiences. But the third sport disproved the thesis that her son was unsportsmanlike. In one study, subjects were given a choice of two gifts a mug and a candy bar. The result was 50-50, about half took the cup, the other half the chocolate. We can therefore assume that the two gifts were more or less equally attractive or that they were considered to be of equal value. But in a second group, the experiment ran differently, first, the subjects were given the cup. Then they had the option to trade the cup for a candy bar. Now just 11% got involved in the trade. So did the cup have any hidden advantages over the candy bar? The counter test contradicted this. In another group, the subjects were first given the chocolate bar and then exchanged it for the cup. Here, too, only about 1 in 10 wanted to swap. What do we learn from this? That we humans are reluctant to give up what we call our own. We assign a higher value to things as soon as we feel they are our own. In psychology this is called, endowment effect or possession effect. The reason for this is our tendency to assume the bad. We don't want to get the short end of the stick if we trade something or give it away in any other way. The technical term for this misconception is negativity distortion. Numerous studies show how much the negativity bias limits our reasoning. Just think how hard it is to part with clothes you haven't worn in years. But even this misconception can be overturned. And you do this by taking advantage of the phenomenon that we are reluctant to lose out on. A patient with lung cancer may stiffen before a complicated operation at its risk. Or he can concentrate on the fact that the surgery increases his chance of survival to 90%. In other words, he is more likely to lose if he does not have the operation. The example shows that we can actively frame options and issues positively. So don't let your tendency to pessimism slow you down. Start using your knowledge of negativity bias. For example, be careful with free trials you end up paying for the service only because you're reluctant to give it up. So consider beforehand whether it is worth your money. Beware of deep convictions, the tendentious interpretation. You remember the confirmation bias from earlier, we like to filter information in a way that confirms our expectations. Closely related to this is the phenomenon of tendentious interpretation. With this we cling so hard to established beliefs that we defend them to the death if necessary even if all facts speak against it. This is exactly what happened to the author during her first pregnancy. She read an article in the trade journal Nature. 
It said children who slept with night lights on were five times more likely to become nearsighted later on. So she crossed the item night light off her nursery shopping list. However, a year later, Nature reported, the study drew the wrong conclusions. Because the researchers had not taken into account whether the baby's parents were short-sighted themselves. Apparently, the parents' nearsightedness made them more likely to install night lights. And since myopia is hereditary, it was probably genetics rather than night lights that caused the children to become myopic. But this correction did not change Ahn's conviction. And so she didn't use night lights with her second child either. The misconception that there was a causal link between night light and myopia had already become a belief. And not even the changed facts were able to change that. Unfortunately, such tendentious interpretations cannot be overturned as easily as most other errors in reasoning. They are part of our cognitive top-down processing, our brains must process new information into beliefs in order to make sense of the world. This usually happens unconsciously and automatically and is therefore not easily reversible. Behavioral approaches to this are effective but uncomfortable. With other solutions, the main thing is to be aware of the tendentious interpretation. Realize the suffering and conflict that arises when people hold on to stubborn prejudices against people who are different from them. This awareness alone can help to change society for the better. We understand each other less than we think, the problem with the change of perspective. We humans are damn bad at reading between the lines. And literally, for a study, two friends were asked to write each other short emails, each containing one sentence. Half of these emails were meant to be sarcastic, the other half serious. Then the recipients should determine which message was meant and how. The result? They were wrong half the time. Although the participants in this study understood the sentences correctly when the friends recited them orally, in other studies there were also problems with verbal communication. Even if people knew each other well. So we understand each other less than we think. Even if we go into the exchange with good intentions and are familiar with our communication partners. The reason for this is simple, no matter how sincerely we want to empathize with others, the change of perspective is not our forte. We find it difficult to discard our own view of things. And the more we assume in communication, the faster we talk past each other. No question. Empathy and sincere interest promote mutual understanding. But if you really want to be on the safe side, two things help above all. First, be as clear as possible in your communications. This is especially true in written communication. Even if you have to write an extra sentence or use an emoji. Second, if you want to understand others, don't try to read their minds. Stop guessing or assuming. No matter how well you know someone, just ask. We think too little about our future selves, the problem of delayed gratification. Imagine you have two options. Either, you get $340 here and now, or, you wait six months and get $350 in return. How would you decide? If you tick like most people, you take the $340. What you have, you have. Now what if we up the ante, and you got $390 in six months? Even then, most people decide against the additional $50 and for the immediate payout. Such tests show how difficult it is for us to delay rewards. Even if it would make much more rational sense to wait. Let's explain this using the experiment mentioned. As said, most people go for the lower amount. Some argue that they could invest the money and earn more in six months than the promised extra $50. Others fear that an unforeseen event could prevent them from receiving the award. In purely rational terms, both arguments are weak. No normal investment allows such a high return in such a short time. And it is just as unlikely that some kind of apocalypse will prevent the researchers from paying out the bonus. And yet studies show that we stick to precisely such arguments when making decisions that tend to be narrow. There are three reasons we have a hard time delaying gratification. The first is our all-too-human lack of self-control. It takes strength to pull yourself together and wait for a reward. A proven remedy is distraction. In studies, it was easier for the participants to postpone it if they could keep themselves busy. At best, you're distracting yourself in a meaningful way. Imagine you have a delicious dessert in the fridge and want to save it for dinner with a friend. But the temptation is great to eat it beforehand. Then distract yourself from this temptation by going for a run, tidying up or picking up an exciting book. The second reason is our aversion to uncertainty. That too is normal. 
That's why we all tend to attach conditions to decisions and only commit ourselves when all uncertainties have been eliminated. Here it helps to separate certain circumstances from uncertain ones and to examine exactly to what extent they depend on one another. Let's say your final exam is coming up. Besides, you would like to go on vacation. Then many of us tend to make vacations conditional on passing the exam. But if you plan to go on vacation anyway, then don't make it dependent on the outcome of the exam, but stand by this decision. This allows you to plan ahead and also gives you something to look forward to even if the exam fails. The third reason for our delayed gratification problem is our now reference. It is difficult for us to empathize with future sensations. Your current self has almost no emotional connection to your future self. But you can learn to strengthen that connection. Set goals and keep them in mind regularly. Visualize them positively impacting your life. This puts your behavior in the here and now in relation to your future. This can help you wait for rewards because you know your future self will benefit from it. Conclusion Making mistakes in reasoning is deeply human. We all commit them all the time, even cognition researchers like Wu Kyung An. But many of these misconceptions can be undone. The first step is to become aware of these cognitive biases. Try to question your own decisions and thought processes from time to time. The strategies presented here will help you to better understand yourself and other people. We trust that you found this brief guide enjoyable. Please share your feedback in the comments section below, including your impressions on this course and your interests for future learning topics. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great content in the future.